Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sorry if my camera's a little dark. I'm outside in the splendor of Nevada, so uh, I wanted to keep on theme with our special guest today. Um, I am Danny Le. I am a librarian here at the Santa Clara City Library. Thank you for tuning into our talk with uh, Jeremy Lin, uh, a representative of the parks, uh, and, and someone who really cares and wrote amazing academic paper on how volunteers and how people, regular people like us uh, help to sustain uh, the park services as well as our uh, natural environment. Um, I'm gonna read Jeremy's bio real quick and I'm gonna hand it over to him uh, afterwards. Jeremy has over 12 years of experience working in the fields of interpretation, outdoor education and conservation. Prior to working as an interpreter and volunteer coordinator for Sierra and Santa Cruz districts, Jeremy led backcountry trail crews in Alaska and Maine with his National Park Service and taught field biology in the Coast Redwood region. He graduated with his BA in Environmental Study degree from University of California, Santa Cruz, and with an MA in Environmental Studies degrees from Prescott College in Arizona. Jeremy enjoys learning about wilderness medicine, plays guitar and bass, Jeremy and his wife, Jasmine, live in Truckee, California, and enjoy snowboarding in the winter and backpacking in the summer. Without further ado, everybody, welcome Jeremy Lynn. What's up, man? Thank you for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining in. I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and about the park system and kind of some of the findings that we've had. So um, I've got, I'm going to share my screen here and just kind of, just kind of dive, dive right into this. All right, so um, my, again, my name is Jeremy Lin. I work for California State Parks. I'm based in Lake Tahoe area, so Sierra District um, of the state park system. I also just came from Santa Cruz District State Parks um, where I did a lot of volunteer coordination and kind of learned uh, that kind of the whole park system. So I went to uh, school in Prescott College <clears throat> uh, for, my, for my master's and I graduated recently and I did a bunch of research on how volunteers impact public lands. So I'm just gonna kind of start getting into a little bit of this presentation here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the literature view on how volunteers impact public lands. I'm really passionate about uh, protecting our public lands and the long-term planning that it takes in order to sustain our uh, access to public lands and also our habitat, um, healthy habitat, cleaning trash and just keeping our public lands um, healthy from all sorts of perspectives. I'm very passionate about that. And I do think that it's volunteers. And I know there's a lot of volunteers on this uh, call right now that, that um, are serving public lands. And so thank you so much for all your work that you're doing. I think that this is the model that moving forward, we're gonna have to adopt is local community members contributing to their park system are ultimately gonna save our, our natural lands and our parks. All right. <clears throat> So um, I'm gonna quickly just do a brief literature review just to kind of talk about some of the um, current academic literature on volunteers. So I'm gonna talk about, um, I've delineated volunteer impact into three categories taken from scholarly research on volunteer programs worldwide. So social impacts include things like individual and community health, civic engagement and education. The environmental impacts we'll talk about include habitat restoration, citizen science and environmental policy. Economic impacts of volunteering include offsetting operational costs, generating profit, and fundraising for projects. <clears throat> All right, so the social impacts of volunteer programs. So again, this is a brief literature review. This is kind of like setting the stage for my, for my research that I'll, that I'll talk about. All right, so, um, so some of the social impacts of volunteer programs. So volunteers gain professional and technical skills. It's one of the benefits. Volunteers also experience um, increased psychological and physical health. So you volunteers out there, I know you're probably, you know, kind of attuned to this, is oftentimes we just feel better when we're out there volunteering. Um, we're getting stimulated, we're sometimes challenging ourselves physically and mentally, we're experiencing this health from volunteering. Uh, volunteers may be more likely to be involved in civic matters and discussion. It brings people into the conversation. Sometimes we get so siloed in our little houses or our, our worlds, but going outside into another organization oftentimes it brings us out into this larger world kind of widens the perspective. Um, positive social returns on investment, there's this measurement called SRI. Um, we're seeing that generally social returns on investment are positive with volunteer programs. <clears throat> All right, so the environmental impacts of volunteers. 
Uh, so volunteers have been proven successful in restoration. There's been a lot of studies showing that a volunteer who knows very little or not too much about that specific project can jump in and really contribute to um, whatever projects being, being, um, being done in a given area with habitat restoration. All right, so uh, citizen science. So citizen science is data collection, which helps to inform park management decisions. Um, examples include data collection or a prevalence of endangered or invasive plant species, and that in help, it helps to inform agency mitigation efforts. So volunteer citizen science efforts are directly impacting policy in certain areas. And volunteers contribute to environmental policy and lobbying efforts. Uh, there's a really great example of this um, with the um, with Ventana Wilderness Alliance. They have lawyers that are actually looking in different areas to, to uh, protect certain lands or change designations of lands that are adjacent to some of the parks and wildlands uh, to improve the um, protection and, and agency investment in those natural resources. <clears throat> all right, so here's a great example. I don't know if you've all, y'all have ever been here, but this is um, part of Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, the, Hen the Santa Cruz Sandhills habitats. They call this the, um, the Galapagos of the Santa Cruz Mountains because it has extraordinary biodiversity and numerous endemic plant and animal species. So technically, the Sandhills are not part of a general plan. And as a result, California State Parks doesn't patrol. They perform very little trail maintenance. And this area is managed almost completely by volunteer efforts. Um, volunteer responsibilities include patrolling, interpreting best practices like no dogs off leash, no bikes on certain trails. Uh, volunteers are doing trail maintenance and habitat restoration and protection efforts. So this is a kind of a prime example of a really sensitive habitat that's in this legal gray zone that volunteers have jumped in to protect. And we're seeing a lot of uh, fruits of that labor of protection, healthy plant and animal species, um, increased endemic plant species health, um, just based on volunteers. All right, so the economic impacts of volunteer programs, uh, they offset operational costs, uh, they can generate profit, and may provide direct fundraising to pay for projects. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about my thesis research, kind of how this ties in. Um, so just kind of a overall, a big picture view on California state parks. Uh, so here's all the parks in California that are California state parks. We have also city parks and county parks and national parks, regional parks that don't quite fall into this. These are just the California state parks. Um, got a lot of stats here, pretty heavily visited. My study sample was in Santa Cruz State Park. So these um, highlighting in blue are the boundaries of the California State Parks in Santa Cruz District. So these are kind of all managed with the same management team, all these parks. Pretty big district, pretty, pretty challenging. We've got Half Moon Bay up at the top, and then we've got uh, parks down in Monterey down at the bottom. So it takes like two plus hours to drive from the top of the park district all the way down to the bottom of the park district. Um, it goes into the mountains. We have all these different habitats, different use areas, uh, ecologically diverse, there's a lot of recreation. Uh, there's 761 long-term volunteers in this set of parks in Santa Cruz. So right now, <clears throat> I'm gonna have us do a little activity here. All right, so you're looking at a beautiful area of Henry Cal Redwood State Park. Um, many of you have been there. So I want you to brainstorm real quick. I want you to think about what type of management issues are just within this frame that we're seeing right now. So if you were a park manager, if you were responsible for protecting this park, what types of work would you have to, to employ just in this little frame here to protect this park? Um, so think about all different facets. Um, if there's maybe some pollution, you might have to clean up pollution. If there are you know, people maybe camping illegally over there, there's a little trail right over there. How would you maintain this trail? So, in, if, if you uh, please put down in the chat, what type of work you think is priority for this spot? Go ahead and throw that in the chat. I'm gonna give like 30 seconds or something. Um, if you were protecting this area, you were responsible for keeping this area um, healthy and um, good for public use, what types of work would you have? What are your priorities? If you just own this and it's for the public, what are your priorities? Um, oops, I don't know if I can get to the chat here or if anyone's even putting anything in the chat. 
<clears throat> so some people that are kind of putting down some of their ideas, they might, they might say, okay, yeah, I'm looking at this area. Um, I'm seeing that habitat restoration, we might have to do some invasive plant species removal, maybe some endangered species monitoring in this area. There are all these different plants here, maybe there's some invasive, maybe some non-natives, maybe protect the native ones. It looks like there's a heavy amount of erosion here. You can see these roots that are kind of getting washed away. There's some work that might have to be done there. Uh, maybe park rules enforced. Uh, some people might be just long-term camping in areas like this. It's like temperate all the time. There we go. Yep, cleaning the garbage in the area, absolutely. Um, signs, yep, signage is big. We wanna kind of talk about the area. Um, maybe there's uh, swimming areas that might be a little bit dangerous. Actually just up the river from this spot is called the Garden of Eden. Have, has anyone been to the Garden of Eden in Henry Cowell? Huge party spot, beautiful area. This massive jump that goes off, you climb up these rocks and you jump off like and maybe like 10 to 20 feet, depending on where you are on the rock. Um, huge party spot, really fun and really beautiful. Uh, but we're, there's all these issues of people jumping and then they jump down into the water and there's like a stick that's sticking up and they just completely land on this stick and they have to get air lifted out because they get such a, a brutal injury that they have to be emergency lifted. Um, so <clears throat> these are just some, some stuff to think about when we think about uh, managing an area. I just kind of want to get us in that mindset. Um, yeah, I like that. So yeah, no fires. I mean, there's, I mean, someone's out there is probably like, oh, it'd be great to look, cook a little hot dog or something right down there. So people are, people do that kind of stuff. They make those poor decisions sometimes that could have bad consequences. All right. Let's see here. Oh. <clears throat> okay. So this brings us to park rangers and budget deficits. Uh, we have been uh, divesting in a lot of our public lands for a long time now. So ranger staff in the Santa Cruz district and statewide is at an all time low despite the ever increasing park visitation and continuous expansion of the park acreage. So rangers are spread super thin and sometimes cover multiple park units in large regions. So the picture we just saw of Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, oftentimes there's one ranger for Henry Cowell for the subunit of Henry Cal, the Fall Creek unit, and also for Castle Rock State Park, and also for Portola or Redwood State Park. So you have three massive state parks, and you have one ranger on duty that's doing law enforcement stuff. Uh, volunteers are sometimes called free labor. Um, however, that they can be very costly. So we'll talk a little bit about the costs of having volunteer programs and some of the benefits of having these volunteer programs. All right, so here are some volunteer roles. We have visitor services. We've got interpretation and education, conservation, uh, trails and facilities maintenance, backcountry patrols. And that's a great one to get into first if you're not quite sure exactly what you wanna do is just get out there and hike and take a look at the trails and go explore and go see what's out there and get to know the park and become an expert in the backcountry. That's one of the better ways to kind of initially become a volunteer and then you kind of get fine tuned into other responsibilities. Um, fundraising. All right, so here are my core research questions. All right, are volunteers accomplishing the specific tasks identified by the volunteer coordinator? Are volunteers being adequately trained? What are the benefits and challenges associated with volunteer programs serving California State Parks? And what are the characteristics of highly effective volunteer programs? All right, so we're gonna get into kind of meat of my research. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this relates to the real world. So some of my methods for my research, I email out surveys to all the volunteers and, and the, all the volunteer coordinators in the Santa Cruz district, all the parks within the Santa Cruz district. I had qualitative and quantitative questions. Um, I'm studying the attitude, behavior, and demographics of my study sample. Um, so for instance, volunteer coordinators, I asked, what are your biggest challenges when coordinating volunteers? Um, how many hours do you spend each month managing the volunteers? And for the volunteers, I was asking questions like, what specific tasks do you accomplish on a volunteer shift? I'm really trying to kind of narrow it down and isolate exactly what's being done out there to be able to quantify this work that's being done. Um, and which of the volunteer contributions um, during your volunteer service do you think are the most impactful? 
let's move on to the results section. All right, so quick little overview of the results here. Um, I had a 23% response rate. As anyone knows who's trying to get data and collect surveys, 23% is not that bad. That's, that's pretty good. I, no one really wants to sit down and do a 15 minute survey if they don't have to. So I kind of had to really push for people to, com to complete these. 109 female participants in this survey, 59 male. Um, it's kind of fascinating here. We had uh, the majority or a lot the highest frequency of our volunteers has postgraduate degrees. So oftentimes I can kind of see this as very successful folks who have kind of come up through the educational system and had their career um, and have been successful and have been like, okay, well now I can retire and now I can contribute my time to the park system or a volunteer role. We're seeing that pattern quite a bit in here with a lot of postgraduate degree people. Um, yeah, interesting, mostly female um, volunteers at the park system, at least for this, this sample group. I'm not sure exactly why that is, um, but noticeably uh, more, more female. Um, and I did have a question on non-binary or prefer not to answer, um, but no one chose those categories in that survey. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's go over some of the results. Um, so parks, so these are the parks I've highlighted with the highest volunteer survey response. Uh, so these 10 parks have relatively large volunteer programs with some parks like Anya Nuevo State Park, it's the, the red one right there, uh, has nearly 200 volunteers just at one of these parks. So as we can see, uh, many of the parks, many of the volunteers aren't spread out evenly throughout the park system here. They're very highly concentrated in these areas. So probably the most, um, I don't know, consequential finding of this paper is that longer volunteer tenure was significantly correlated with parks that employ more than one volunteer coordinator. So this was fascinating for me on a volunteer coordinator standpoint, because this shows that we lower the rate of attrition <clears throat> if we can provide multiple people coordinating volunteers. So if we can <clears throat> provide more support for our volunteers, then they stick around longer. And that's also helpful for us because that reduces the amount of time that we're spending training new volunteers and recruiting and trying to build our volunteer base. If we can invest initially more in volunteers, then we can, we can keep people around longer and they're more committed to the parks for a longer term. So when asked about, um, I asked volunteers what they perceive to be their most commonly used professional skill. So communication was far and away the most useful volunteer skill, um, <clears throat> according to volunteers. So other helpful professional skills were management experience, environmental knowledge, and organizational skills. But by far and away, <clears throat> the, at least this set of volunteers within the Santa Cruz district felt communication was most likely is because they're uh, leading tours. We had volunteers leading long form hikes, elephant seal tours, mountain bike tours, uh, kayak tours, uh, beach cleanups, beach education, tide pool tours. We just had volunteers just leading a lot of tours. And so the communication really helped them out, especially if they're leading like large school groups and things like that. We found that communication was a useful skill. All right. Um, when asked about the areas where volunteers feel they can make the most positive impact, Answers included providing interpretive programming, uh, sharing and practicing stewardship ideals, assisting in public safety and services for park visitors, and other important work includes visitor services, trail maintenance, research. Um, when asked to describe the positive impacts of their volunteer service, um, participants shared many personal stories. So here's some, some quotes from volunteers. And I know we have several volunteers that are on this, on this uh, presentation. So you'll probably May, hopefully probably relate to some of these things. Uh, so uh, when asked to describe the positive impacts of their service, volunteers say that they help visitors feel the park. And I share my love for the natural world around me in hopes that park visitors will also realize the same love themselves. One volunteer is proud to demonstrate an open-hearted commitment toward public safety. 
So volunteers really express a lot of personal enthusiasm and interest in helping other people. And I think this also ties into that psychological health that we saw a lot from the literature view of the benefits of contributing, um, the gift of giving, and how oftentimes giving and contributing to the park system has a return on the person who's contributing that time in very positive ways. <clears throat> when asked about the most rewarding aspects of their service, volunteers are proud to help people, help protect natural resources, and occasionally have personal moments of wonder. Uh, one volunteer experiences feelings of accomplishment, service, and gratitude. Um, another experiences feeling a sense of wholeness that comes from giving back to the parks. So what I've noticed is a lot of volunteers are kind of achieving this sense of wholeness and this sense of purpose through their volunteer service. So in addition to really contributing to the park goals and mission, uh, these, these really generous folks are gaining this kind of sense of purpose um, <clears throat> from their service. And I just think that's, I think that's beautiful. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna move into the volunteer coordinator survey. Uh, so 100% rate on this one of all the volunteer coordinators. So 19 volunteer coordinators, um, field volunteer coordinators in, at Santa Cruz district. Um, and I knew them all. So I basically just told them all they had to do this thing. So I, I bothered them until they completed this. So I got all, everybody. <clears throat> um, 12 female, seven male. And here we go again, we've got more female volunteer coordinators and male. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe another study should go into that. Um, but as we can kind of see here, uh, the majority of volunteer coordinators have fewer than five years of professional experience in this field. That's pretty telling. That kind of shows it might not be a long range career. People come in one to five years and then they're out, which I think is a hindrance to the institutional knowledge and being able to uh, kind of perpetuate some of this knowledge and some of these practices for a long period of time when we have a pretty high turnaround. But that being said, we have folks that, you know, over 20 years in the volunteer coordination field. <clears throat> All right, so volunteer coordinators believe that volunteers are well to extremely well trained <clears throat> and prepared for their park service. So we found that most of them feel that volunteers are doing a really good job. And so, I guess I'll do a quick aside here. There's been very little academic literature specifically for volunteers in the California, in the, in the park system in general, national parks. There's really not a lot of data. So a lot of these findings here might kind of seem like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, volunteers do pretty well, but there really hasn't been much research on this. So it's important that this type of thing gets documented and published in academic literature uh, because this is kind of the building block foundation for us learning more about how volunteers impact public lands. There's really not much. So I encourage anyone who wants to do research and new grad students uh, to focus <clears throat> on volunteers on public lands because we don't know a lot about that in terms of the academic and scholarly realm. All right, so the majority of volunteer coordinators are confident that volunteers are accomplishing the objectives outlined in their duty statements. It's good news. All right, so I asked about the actual and optimal number of volunteers that should be managed by a single volunteer coordinator. It was kind of interesting. So the optimal number of volunteers per coordinator was perceived to be 10 to 25 by most respondents. However, 26 to 50 was the most common number of actual volunteers each volunteer coordinator manages. So there seemed to be a bit of a variation within the optimal numbers per volunteer coordinator response. But we're seeing that in general, <clears throat> um, oftentimes, Volunteer, volunteer coordinators are managing more volunteers than they are able to, to handle. Um, so if you think about the amount of work that a single volunteer does uh, versus the amount of time that it takes for a volunteer coordinator to get them trained up and ready to do it, we're getting a massive return on investment. If we have one volunteer coordinator and 25 volunteers going out there doing trail work, leading interpretive tours, doing habitat restoration, it's a massive return on investment. Um, but sometimes our volunteer coordinators are a bit overwhelmed. Sometimes they have too many volunteers and they're not able to manage a large amount of volunteers. All right, so I asked about the amount of time volunteer coordinators spend <clears throat> on training uh, versus the amount of time coordinating volunteers. 
So volunteer coordinators spend less time training and more time coordinating. Uh, however, some volunteer coordinators report over 50% of their time spent on coordinating volunteers. Um, and that's also something to note is oftentimes these volunteer coordinators have so many other responsibilities. They're managing a budget, they're doing administrative stuff. They are also doing like interpretive walks or doing trail work, that kind of thing. All right, so let's move on to the discussion here. All right, so volunteers prior professional skills are important for their success in parks. Um, so <clears throat> to volunteer coordinators out there, it's beneficial for your organization most likely to recruit volunteers with these prior um, volunteer, these relevant skills uh, like communication. Maybe you, there's a, someone who's an expert on certain type of habitat restoration. It's beneficial for volunteer coordinators to recruit volunteers that have these skill sets. Uh, volunteers benefit from meaningful visitor interaction and sharing stewardship ideals. It just seems that a lot of these volunteers gain such a personal achievement and personal purpose um, when they're out um, volunteering at the park system. All right, and so volunteers' biggest challenge is the understaffing. So a lot of every, so many volunteers were like, I feel underutilized, I feel ignored, I have all these skill sets, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to you know, plow the snow trails out here. So cross country skiers are ready to go. I'm ready to go hike out to the distance to, you know, clean up homeless encampments with pollution everywhere. I'm ready to do it, but I'm not supported enough. Um, maybe some of you volunteers out here in this presentation can relate to that. Sometimes you have this great skill set, but you might not feel like they're being utilized. Um, volunteers trend towards more elderly populations. So I do see that this might be somewhat of an issue if we have a lot of our volunteers in this more elderly bracket and we don't have many young people volunteering. Um, what happens when some of the older folks start to age out a little bit? We might not really have this volunteer base that we rely on um, over years. So I think it's very vitally important to get young, young folks involved in volunteering as well so we can just kind of create this culture and this community of volunteering um, all ages all ages. <clears throat> all right, so there are discussion for the volunteer coordinators here. So volunteer coordinators believe that volunteers with professional skills, most notably communication, contribute to their success. Volunteer coordinators are overwhelmed by the high number of volunteers they manage. So we need to invest more in our volunteer coordinators to keep them going, to keep them able to uh, continue to power our volunteer management system so we can continue to offer our programs and uh, empower the volunteers to do the amount of work that they're doing. And so, yeah, volunteer coordinators also believe that communication contributes, the commun skill of communication among their volunteers co contributes to their success because that's a major responsibility of what volunteers are doing. So volunteer coordinator attrition is high, might be the pay. So I think that, you know, that's one issue is you have some relatively new volunteer coordinators that come in, uh, don't have a lot of experience. They start to gain experience, start to gain momentum. And then they're like, well, this is not a sustainable career path for me. I need to move on and do something else. Even though the impact of them being there coordinating volunteers to do all these different jobs and all this different work is so impactful. I don't think that in many park systems we're recognizing how impactful volunteer coordinators are. I think they need to get paid more or at least get housing. I mean, a little side tangent here is our park systems have a lot of land and there's a lot of opportunity to build houses on the land or put um, trailers out there or have living units out on this land. Like what parks has is, is a lot of land and opportunity to house some of the workers. But instead they go, okay, I'm gonna pay my worker like minimum wage and they won't even get a house on here and they have to like pay like rent in the Bay Area on a minimum wage. It's kind of ridiculous to me. That's a little soapbox item there. Um, they need to pay these people. All right, looks like Valerie's got my back. All right. Um, perpetually new volunteer coordinator staff results in inadequate professional training and underutilization of workplace skills. It's amazing the amount the bureaucracy is real. It's amazing the amount of, of skills and knowledge that you have to get working for an agency. And you guys probably understand working where you are, 
to really get a grasp of how to do your job. And I don't think this is just limited to volunteer coordination. I think there's a lot of different professions out there where you got to work like, like Danny at the library. It's hard to just pop in and all of a sudden be an expert. You're, you need to gain these skills. And the sad, tragic part is people finally get these skills and they start to understand how to hone their craft. And then they're like, all right, well, I, I can't afford to do this. So I'm gonna have to leave. <clears throat> all right. Um, uh, I think I skipped something here. I know I'm good. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to bring it back to our initial research questions and see how this research addressed these questions. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications for the field. <clears throat> All right, so are volunteers accomplishing the specific tasks identified by their volunteer coordinator? So our research indicates that yes, volunteers are well trained and equipped to perform tasks outlined in their duty statements. Volunteers are crucial components to many park units by leading interpretive programs, providing visitor services, and maintaining the trails. However, volunteers that possess relevant skills like communication, route management, trail work, make them much more effective in their service. So the message I have for volunteer coordinators is do some targeted recruitment. Don't just open it up maybe for everybody who wants to, <clears throat> even though that's generally what we do because we just want, we'll take anybody, um, but perhaps teachers unions, retired teachers, um, <clears throat> uh, retired firefighters, you know how to use tools, that kind of thing, of our often, uh, resources that we can tap into to get people who are skilled and able to do this. I'm not saying we limit it just to those people with those skills, but that's one recruitment tool if you have a specific thing that you're trying to accomplish at your park. <clears throat> are volunteers um, being adequately trained? So yes, volunteers are adequately trained and most volunteers are receive 30 hours of formal in-person training. Uh, so this, again, this is within the sample of Santa Cruz State Parks. Uh, so other park systems might be different. However, additional specialized training would be beneficial. These trainings could include using technology, operating mechanized tools for trail work, and staying up to date on the frequently changing departmental policies. So even though <clears throat> volunteers are well-trained, there could be little bonus trainings or little booster trainings. <clears throat> All right, uh, what are the benefits and challenges associated with volunteers uh, serving California State Parks. So I'm going to start with the challenges. All right, so <clears throat> each volunteer program is unique and therefore needs to be specifically designed to meet the goals of each park unit. For instance, Santa Cruz Mission, a uh, state historical park, whose main focus is interpreting the California Mission era, has vastly contrasting management priorities than a park like the Anuelo State Park, whose major draw is the coastal beaches and guided elephant seal tours. Uh, volunteer programs at these two parks are vastly different and therefore recruitment has to be different and training is different. Also volunteer programs may be a costly investment. So volunteer coordinator salaries, uh, uniforms for volunteers, equipment for volunteers, recruiting volunteers and training them takes time and resources. However, data suggests that it is a worthy investment and will pay off if agencies invest in their volunteer programs. Um, it, it, you will get that return on investment. If we do invest more in our volunteer coordinators, our volunteer programs and our volunteers, we will get a ton in return um, just from the cost benefit analysis. All right, so volunteer programs providing benefits include developing, or the benefits include developing community commitments and advocates for the park system. If you bring a volunteer in who was just maybe a park visitor before and now they're volunteering, all of a sudden you have this advocate for the park system. They're representing the park system, wherever they are. Maybe they're at a town hall meeting, maybe they're working with a group of friends, maybe they're at a different organization. They are a volunteer, the representative of the park system. They, we brought them into that community. Now we've grown our community, not just our park staff, we have our community members that live in the area, contributing to the park, building that family. Also by including volunteers, the park system gains diverse perspectives and reliable workers with many professional skills. Um, oftentimes when you go into a park system, you see kind of the same blueprint of the person, of the, the, the kind of staff. Oftentimes it's not as diverse. 
Oftentimes it's not representative of the population of California or the United States or the people who visit the park system. It's sometimes very homogenous. Things are starting to change, but we're kind of seeing that bringing in different types of volunteers who look differently, that are diverse, that are bringing different perspectives is ultimately gonna be beneficial to the park system because we're trying to make it inclusive and increase access to all these people. So we need to bring in people of all different colors, all different faiths, all different backgrounds and experiences. Um, some efficient and resilient volunteer programs can run near autonomously without the need for heavy involvement from the park staff. Obviously there's a lot of issues that can arise with volunteer programs, um, but um, throughout this research, I've seen and interviewed volunteer coordinators that just have this thing dialed. They've got their software system for scheduling shifts and calculating hours. They've got a report system if something goes wrong. The volunteer knows the exact chain of command or what they do if they're experiencing some kind of issue or some kind of injury or a problem with a park visitor. Uh, so these things can be dialed down so we don't have this <clears throat> very costly time and resource investment on the park agency. It can be really automated. So we just have this clean system in place. <clears throat> uh, let's see, what are the characteristics of highly effective volunteer programs? All right, so parks should employ more than one volunteer coordinator staff. That's kind of the, the key, I think, that's the main takeaway. If we have more than one volunteer coordinator, then all of a sudden we don't, if one volunteer coordinator goes on vacation, it's not like, oh, there's no one at the helm of this ship. We have multiple people that we can talk to that volunteers can check in with that seek leadership, that are setting the tone, that are directing and driving the ship. Uh, parks that employ experienced volunteer coordinators for long periods of time. If we can reduce the attrition of volunteer coordinator staff, and probably a lot of, I think there's several volunteers within this call right now. I mean, you might have seen already an overturn of your volunteer coordinators. You might have already seen that one quit, a new one came up and kind of got up to speed and kind of learned a little bit and then they moved on. If we just have this solid system of paying volunteer coordinators a living wage, making it a, a career and a possibility to stick around for longer than just sometimes 18 months or less, two years, people can stick around for a longer period of time, then we kind of solidify our processes and our function and we're able to run these programs much more smoothly than a frequent turnover. Uh, so parks that minimize a ratio of volunteers for each volunteer coordinator with about 10 to 50 volunteers per volunteer coordinator maximum. I mean, that's kind of a wide range, 10 to 50, but it depends on the nature of that program. So sometimes you have really sensitive programs like interpreting uh, like the mission era or kind of these more nuanced or sensitive topics. Maybe you need just one volunteer coordinator for like 10, but oftentimes you can scale this up and have 50 volunteers per volunteer coordinator. All right, so another um, characteristic of a highly effective program is parks that recruit volunteers based on relevant professional skills and experience. <clears throat> so um, we're actually, I have a volunteer coordinator training on Saturday. So day after tomorrow, I'm training 12 new volunteers for Donna Memorial State Park. And I've reached out all across the board to retired teachers, unions. I've reached out to uh, mountain bike. We're leading mountain bike tours now out in Donna Memorial State Park. They're guided interpretive mountain bike tours. I reached out to the mountain bike community and I said, we need people who know about mountain biking that are also interested in talking about the nature and the culture, uh, cultural history of the park who want to come out to be trained to become a volunteer to lead the public on tours in our back country uh, that is like Tahoe National Forest uh, bike trails just over here uh, to help us interpret recreation, but also the history. Um, so I recruited specifically kind of targeted recruitment to volunteers with relevant professional skills. Um, and finally, uh, frequent general and specialized training for both volunteer coordinators and volunteers. So ideally your volunteer training and volunteer coordinator training isn't just like once a year, once every couple of years, maybe you have routine meetings. You get together every once in a while, maybe have potluck, have a special guest speaker, kind of update everyone on what's happening, on the change of the park and what's going on. <clears throat> All right, so implications of the field and then I'm basically wrapping pretty soon here. Yeah, okay. 
All right, so um, volunteer coordinators and volunteers are essential to the function of many park units. So a lot of volunteer, a lot of park units would just not really function without volunteers. Look at Ani Nuevo State Park. The entirety of their elephant seal tours are done with volunteers. So they have 200 volunteers and they're on this rotating basis. So during elephant seal breeding season, you just have this like rotating door of, of tours going out led by volunteers. Uh, volunteers are well-trained and equipped for their park service. Um, volunteers are passionate and proud of their work in parks. So a lot of this stuff kind of might seem like, well, duh, like we kind of know this stuff already. <clears throat> but again, there have been very few academic studies that have focused on uh, volunteer effectiveness of serving, Cal of serving the park system. So even though this kind of seems like, yeah, we know that they're passionate and they, they're proud of working their parks, there's not a lot of scholarly work that really just kind of documents this from like a quantitative research standpoint. So kind of hitting upon these. So volunteer attrition is lower in parks that employ two or more volunteer coordinators and recruiting volunteers with relevant professional skills reduces impact on the agency resources. Long-term volunteer coordinators protect institutional knowledge and are capable of achieving park objectives. So really the crux of this whole research and my findings is that if we're able to invest more in our volunteers and our volunteer coordinators, we will reap the fruits of of that investment. We will be able to conduct more interpretive tours, we'll be able to restore more habitat, our trails will be more pristine and open and clear, um, able to you know, hike through and backpack through. Uh, we have better services when offering interpretive tours to folks who are wanting to learn about the natural and cultural history of the area. We need to invest more in our volunteer systems in the park system. All right, so I could recommend for future research, we expand the study system um, and also investigate the causes and consequences of volunteer coordinator attrition. I suspect it's you know, primarily monetary. We're just not paying people very well to do a very important job. All right. Duty statements are really important. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Um, Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, <laughs> can you start your sharing real quick? Um, yeah. And anybody uh, out there, uh, we got, you know, a few moments we could probably ask Jeremy a question. I definitely have a lot of questions, but if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, I just want to kick it off with the fact that you brought up something very important that, uh, one, it's uh, compensation to do an important job. And the, and the reflection of our the, your volunteer coordinators. And I think a lot of our uh, career-based uh, service industries, a lot of young, youthful people who have a lot of energy, but once uh, living, especially in California, once things get expensive, they have to shift their focus onto something else, maybe more manageable. Um, do you think, uh, are we doing enough to uh, grab as many um, talented, but also pe passionate people into uh, our California Park Services, or is it is it are they coming because they naturally inclined to serve uh, in that capacity to the parks? Yeah, great question. Um, I think we need to do more in reaching out to different demographic areas and different just people who might not we call them non traditional park users, people who don't aren't initially inclined, maybe traditionally marginalized communities that aren't really participating in these public resources like these park systems. I mean, like those of us here, if you've ever been on a, on a hike at some point overlooking this vista, you kind of round a turn and you just have this like amazing view and there's like a red tail hawk swooping down in front of you and you're like, <laughs> oh my God, this is like, you're just blown away. There are a lot of communities that's just not part of their culture. Mm -hmm. Their culture, their parents don't go hiking. They're not really, they're just not even really aware that these amazing places are out there. They don't think about that as like, oh, on Saturday, I'm gonna drive to the trailhead park, pay my $10 fee or whatever, and then like go hiking in this beautiful place. It's not part of their culture. Mm -hmm. So I think it's our responsibility as park staff to reach out to these people who might not initially just want to come out to the parks without, you know, they're just, they're just not aware of these resources that are out there. Now, so I think outreach is important. Yeah. Now, um another question with that uh 
what is the requirements for uh, people who do serve? What are the uh, kind of, you know, the min bare minimum requirements necessary for anybody like me who has not volunteered any time yet and who wish to do so? Yeah, great question. So you can get in on, okay, so uh, we're, we're about to conduct this training here this weekend. We have two day training. Um, it's gonna be like nine, like eight hours each day. Um, we're bringing basically people with a lot of relevant skills that like are really specific to some of our programs to people who are just like, no, I'm a you know, retired software engineer and I'm looking to do something completely different that I've never done before. So we basically accept anyone who is passionate about the park system and wants to contribute time. And we wanna bring them in and kind of match them up best we can with their skill set. So some people are like, oh, I've never really led a group before, but I'm kind of interested in seeing if I could like lead a school group of fifth graders on a, on a half an hour long hike, you know, out to Donner Lake. And so we take that enthusiasm, that passion, and we bring people up to speed. We try to give people those skills that they need to be successful. So literally, if you have, even if you have no zero experience at all in the park system or doing any of these jobs, I still encourage you to seek out, if there's something that you're interested in doing to get involved and contribute back, seek out local opportunities to volunteer because the training is really good. It also gives you inspiration because you see all these things happening. It opens your eyes to these things you wouldn't even know really existed. Um, and <clears throat> they welcome you into the park system and teach you how to really contribute. So it's kind of like this, you know, uh, school in a way. They, it's the education system of kind of giving you these new skills and kind of bringing you up to speed and helping you contribute to the park system. So we have a question by Patricia, which probably leads into what you just said. What is the best way to find out nearby opportunities to volunteer? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, uh, well, it, it kind of depends on your where, where you live. So maybe Patricia, while I'm answering this, maybe put in kind of your region or where you're interested in volunteering. So there's a lot of different parks agencies within a given area. Sometimes it's the national park system, sometimes it's state parks, there's county parks, there's city parks, and there's also regional parks. So, I mean, the most basic thing I would recommend is going, pulling up Google Maps and just kind of like zooming out and looking to see where these public lands are. And sometimes there's a nature center, look for different nature centers. That's often a really great way to start getting involved is maybe there is a wild animal rescue. Maybe there's <clears throat> um, some kind of nature preserve, like a bird preserve or like a, um, some kind of natural area that's being managed by some agency. And they often have volunteer trainings that you can contact them and, and see, hey, do you need any help? Um, for instance, one of my friends just started working at uh, with the wildlife rescue here in Tahoe. And sh she just showed me all these like videos of her holding baby raccoons and like <laughs> eating little baby raccoons and like baby chipmunks and also bears. They have this big, this big pen full of black bears that have been injured or hit by cars. And she's helping to rehab. She's like literally hanging out with black bears and feeding them and helping them kind of rehab them. So there's just like so many cool opportunities around there, but oftentimes they're, budget is so minimal, they don't, they can't do a lot of re like outreach. They can't like mm. do postings, <clears throat> like billboards, or they still have the time and resources to outreach. You kind of have to go to them and find them. So I see you're at Santa Clara by the, by the Mission Library. I would have to do a little bit of research um, on that specific area, but I know that um, the, um, I think it's the Mid Peninsula um, open space, regional and mid-peninsula open regional parks or something like that has an amazing volunteer uh, coordination program. Uh, that was, that's one that I recommend just off the top of my head. I don't know your exact neighborhood. Maybe someone else here can kind of recommend some, uh, but definitely explore to see what kind of like green spaces are out there. Dean put in something, you know, they, he says, we have a volunteer work day at hot, Gory Hot Springs on July the 11th. This is Saturday from 8.45 to noon to paint out graffiti, you know, and definitely uh, keeping our environment clean from, you know, any kind of marring up and, you know, destruct, man-made destruction. Definitely check it out. Gory Hot Springs Conservancy.org. Uh, it's right in the chat. Um, I have one more question, Jeremy, then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, and it's about, you know, with the rapid, you know, expansion and growth of the human population and, you know, the high demand of housing, especially in here in California, 
to commerce and amenities, basically taking up land. Is there a danger for the longevity and uh, conservation of our Cal Forest State Parks in the decades ahead? <laughs> it's a big yeah, question. Let's end on a positive note, huh? No, my bad. My yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Well, you know what? We'll pause on that. That's something for us no, no, to no. all ruminate in our lives. But uh, no, I want to take that. I want to take that. Yeah, right. I want to take that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to take that what specifically I'm really happy you asked that one because I'm really optimistic. I know that it's really, it's so easy to kind of get down and you read all the stats and you read all the green, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, I'm optimistic because I know that human beings are so passionate uh, about one each other, but also about our, our natural spaces. And we have these systems in place. And just the fact that the United States and California has these protected areas that we've prioritized uh, to maintain and allow people to have access to these beautiful places and relax and gain that health and everything that everything positive that comes from being in like a beautiful natural environment or you know cultural history exploring or the history of these parks uh, just the fact that we have these codified into law um, and we have so many passionate people that I see every single day contributing to parks on their own accord like a lot like volunteers are not getting paid for this. They're so passionate, personally passionate about the park system that they will prioritize going and fixing something at the park or leading a tour or engaging people over other aspects of their life. So I know we have a lot of challenges happening within the park system and just in society in general, um, but I'm just so humbled every day just to see the energy and the, the passion that people have to protect our park system. And I know that we have a lot of challenges, but I. I, I'm, I'm positive that we, we, have, we can overcome these challenges. I think I'm positive about that too. And I, uh, to confirm it with you, Jeremy, uh, I'm, I'm all about it. I look at the future in a positive, grateful light. Um, where can people find you, Jeremy, whether it's online or in the real world? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, probably the best way is, uh, let's see, I mean, Don, I, I manage the Donner Memorial State Park uh, Facebook page and Instagram. Um, I'm also the official California State Parks page for Donner Memorial. If you just like Google Donner Memorial State Park, um, I manage that page. So we put all of our, our events up there. Um, we have volunteer recruitment information. We have school groups out here. We do a ton of tours. I'm here based at the park. So if you're ever coming up to Donner or Lake Tahoe, I'm doing a bunch of Lake Tahoe stuff too. I just don't join the scuba dive team for Lake Tahoe. So I'm like <laughs> no, scuba diving in Lake Tahoe doing educational programs underwater, which is pretty cool. I just started this thing. Um, so please reach out to me, you know, I'm jeremy.lin at parks.ca.gov. You can call Donner Memorial State Park, get a hold of me. Um, but yeah, Instagram, Facebook, um, yeah, all the socials. And uh, thank you guys for having me. I'll, I'll be in touch. I'll come back for, uh, for a follow-up. I think so. It'd be great to hear more. <laughs> and, um, everybody, so once again, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you for everybody tuning in this afternoon, this early evening. Um, please support our parks. Please support our uh, community. And um, definitely know that uh, anything you do and give to uh, serve our natural environment is a service. So uh, once again, this talk will be uploaded later on social media. So if you have friends who wish to watch this and be invigorated to help out as well, uh, check it out in the Santa Clara City Library YouTube and Facebook pages. Other than that, Everybody be well, be safe, and uh, see you next time. Take care, Jeremy. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye.